Welcome everyone, we'll just give it till uh, one minute past and then we'll get started just to let everyone come in. Great, I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's Net Zero Oceanographic Capability Webinar. I'm going to be your chair for today. I'm Rhiannon Jones. I'm a postgraduate student at the University of Southampton. And in general, I'm an early career ocean professional interested in marine policy. So the aim of today's webinar is to stimulate discussion on the potential areas for international collaboration in a transition towards a net zero ocean oceanographic capability. For context, the Net Zero Oceanographic Capability Report came out earlier this year through the National Oceanography Centre. And in this report, uh, they discuss the importance of international relations in underpinning this transition to net zero through shared information, shared advances and shared facilities and strong international relations, we can accelerate that transition. So this session is going to take two forms. So for the first half, we'll have some flash talks for the project leads on the work packages of the report. And for the second half, we will have an open question and answer discussion session. And for that, we invite you and encourage you to submit questions through Slido. So Slido is the platform we're going to be using for the questions. So if you'd like to go to www.sli.do, which is on the screen there, and the login is hashtag NZOC. So you can submit questions and vote for those that you would like to see answered by our panelists. So I think that's all from me. I will now uh, pass over to the introductory animation, and then we will hear from Lee Story, who is the principal investigator for the NZOC uh, project, um, and also an associate director at NOC, um, who oversees national marine facilities. So with that, um, over to the um, animation. Thank you. Understanding what happens in the ocean is vital because it allows us to better predict the impact of climate change and its effect upon all life on Earth. For the last 150 years, we have explored the ocean using ships, but ships contribute to the amount of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere, something the world is working hard to reduce. In the last two decades, we have also been using satellites and floats more and have even introduced underwater robots which are becoming more advanced at capturing important information from beneath the surface. We all need to transition to a net zero world, including ocean science. This means greener ships, more satellites and ocean robots, such as Boat Team at Boatface, which are able to explore the ocean and collect the data needed to inform global solutions. Research ships remain part of how we undertake ocean science, but they will need to be powered using zero carbon fuels these green vessels will be supported by smart autonomous robots and a data ecosystem that can provide direct access to information from the ships, robots, satellites and floats. With all this digital data, we will be able to model the ocean in even greater detail, providing us with a digital twin of the ocean where we can easily experiment and study different scenarios virtually. We need to do all this by 2040 to meet the UK Research and Innovation Sustainability Strategy. 
and to show that we are part of society, changing its behaviour to save our planet. Good afternoon to everyone from the UK um, and thank you to Rhiannon for that introduction. I've only got one slide um, really to introduce the ENZOC project uh, and then to talk a little bit about some thoughts about where we go uh, in the next steps for this um, programme. So the Net Zero Oceanographic Capability um, project kicked off in the summer of 2020 uh, and the key question that the group were asked to consider was how the UK might maintain or enhance uh, the current oceanographic uh, infrastructure, so the research vessels, the equipment pools that we operate, um, whilst moving to net zero by 2040. The ENSOC reports, um, and some of you will have seen the summary report, but what sits behind that are about 700 pages of detailed reports. Um, I hope covered what I might describe as the scope um, of, of that question. So what might be needed in the future and what tech might be available to support that? What I think we now need to consider in a bit more detail or alongside that scope is the scale. Uh, the, one of the things that's become apparent to me as we've um, undertaken this thinking is that a, a new ecosystem using autonomy uh, that moves away from being ship centric allows us to reimagine how we explore the ocean. Um, and that informs, I think, some of the thinking around what is the scale that we expect this ENSOC um, to be able to explore. And then the pace. Um, the pace uh, of how we make this transition will be informed by the scientists and the users of the data, but also how the tech advances over the coming years. The pace is also really important because it informs who and how we might partner with other organizations, with other countries uh, to try and align um, how we explore the ocean and the tech we use. I think ENSOC sits very nicely within the UN Decade Challenges. Uh, Challenge seven, uh, I think is um, really nicely phrased because not only does it talk about the observing system, but how it um, provides access to timely and actionable data uh, and this flags to me associated issues which ENSOC will overlap with, but will be probably um, uh, dealt with in different forums, which is what are the data standards that, that will be needed in the future and, and how will we uh, address the access to data that we might imagine. So I, I offer this um, sort of future look um, to give you something to think about when you listen to the experts that led each of the work packages uh, and you hear the ideas that they present. Rhiannon, thank you very much. Thank you, Lee, for that introduction there. And so now we will hear from the work package one, and uh, that's the future science need. And we'll hear from Dr. Kate Hendry from the British Antarctic Survey, who is project lead on this work package. Kate is an experienced marine biology chemist and um, regular seagoing scientist. So over to you, Kate. Thanks, Rhiannon. So I think next slide, if possible. I'm still just seeing the animation slide. Ah, oh, there we go. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so um, in work package one, we were looking at the future science needs for um, uh, a net zero oceanographic capability. And um, we carried out a number of workshops and surveys and interviews um, and really divided up the, the topic into two um, different fo uh, foci really. So the first was, what are the science questions that are gonna be important in the next few um, years and decades? And then what are the opportunities in moving towards net zero um, marine research uh, environment? But also what are the challenges involved and what are the potential risks to um, marine science capability as well. So um, to start off with uh, science needs, we talked um, about uh, quite a broad range of different topics with a, a real focus on multidisciplinarity um, and interdiscipline topics as well. 
Um, so here I've just listed a, a few of the topics that came up um, on a more regular basis. So um, thinking in particular about the polar ice cap decline, um, the polar regions are some of the most sensitive in terms of climate change. Um, and um, they're also important um, uh, places where you, where you find feedbacks between um, ocean response and climate as well. So massive implications, not only for what's going on in the poles, but also for global climate as well. Um, ecosystem behavior and how the um, marine ecosystems will be responding to climate change. Um, and then um, the actual response of the ocean itself directly to, um, to warming and what this will mean uh, for changes in sea level as the um, sea expands and as um, land ice melts, but also how this influences the atmosphere um, impacting uh, weather, including extreme events and also longer term climate as well. And of course, with um, you know, a decade coming along, a lot of these um, science questions are going to be geared in particular towards those of societal relevance. So thinking about um, geohazards, I've already mentioned sea level rise um, and extreme events, but also um, things like underwater volcanoes, landslides and so on. And of course, ocean health and food security um, and um, how offshore development could be impacting our natural resources. Um, and, and thinking of natural resources, of course, the economic and carbon benefits of, of a future sustainable um, economy. And so that links in nicely to the last point here on the slide, which is that um, although these are already important questions for understanding the role of the oceans in um, global climate, um, and we've got to do this by 2014 in a net zero way, also these questions feed intrinsically back into understanding how we can make um, the uh, the world net zero in the future. So we really need to understand these science questions if we're going to move towards a net zero future. Next slide, please. So um, some of the findings that came out of the discussions with the UK marine science community is that um, we're actually moving in a direction that will help us um, with our net zero targets by increasingly using autonomous vehicles, as has already been mentioned. Marine science is also increasingly becoming interdisciplinary and um, thinking about the oceans in a holistic way. And um, everyone in the UK marine science community, I, I, I think I can say that, is um, it, it, understanding that international collaboration is key for all of this and that we also need to invest in um, technology development um, in, a, in a careful way. And there are a number of opportunities, so we can take more measurements um, over uh, a wider range of scales, uh, both spatial and temporal. And there are potentially exciting new experiments that could be done that wouldn't have been possible before. For example, we can get to places that we couldn't get to before, um, such as under ice or in the deep ocean. And, and also this idea of an emerging data ecosystem where we can carry out near real time observing. This is something that just wasn't feasible before. But there are risks, um, including that some uh, experiments and disciplines may not be supported, some developments may not meet our requirements, and that we need to really make sure that we don't have any sort of sceptical reception to, to these new methods. We need to test them really thoroughly. So I've, I've totally run out of time, so I'll leave you with my recommendations um, at the bottom there, uh, which we, uh, we need to embed scientists into hardware and software development. We need to train the next generation of scientists and, and use G7 and UN Decade as springboards. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for that uh, comprehensive overview of that first work package. That was great. So we'll now move on to the work package two, which is policy and regulation. And this will be presented by the work package lead, Professor Steve Fletcher at the University of Southampton. Steve is a professor of ocean policy and economy and director of sustainability and environment at Portsmouth Uni. Over to you, Steve. Hi, thank you very much, Rhiannon. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the policy and regulation work package. Now, can I have the next slide, uh, please? There were two main elements of this work package. One was to try and understand how the ENSOC capability can support policy making, delivery, and evaluation moving forward. And secondly, how the current uh, policy and regulation framework either enables or constrains our move to uh, an ENSOC uh, future. I'll take each of those in turn and uh, just describe the highlights of our findings. Uh, first, it was clear that uh, an ENSOC uh, approach can support our existing and new 
policy areas, providing that it is designed with interdisciplinarity in mind. And Kate alluded to this uh, in the previous talk, but there's a real recognition that natural science alone is not sufficient to support uh, integrated marine policy. And we really need to bring the natural science and combine it with the social science and the economics and increasingly the creative arts as well in ensuring uh, rounded policy making. So any NZOC data collection process really needs to be uh, able to be linked comprehensively to other forms of data collection and recognizing that policy needs are more holistic and rounded than perhaps they were framed uh, previously. Secondly, that NZOC can support a global shift to a sustainable ocean. The move towards a sustainable ocean uh, economy, a sustainable blue economy, uh, is clear. The policy shift is happening, and we need to understand how an NZOC capability can uh, support that shift. But it absolutely can, providing the data collection focus uh, is um, appropriate to the needs of that uh, shift. Uh, thirdly, that um, NZOC itself can unlock opportunities for broader engagement with policymaking and more innovative uh, policymaking in itself. And this is a very nice connection to the UN decade uh, as well. The narrative in the decade talks about the need to transition ocean science to a situation in which it better serves society. Uh, with the need for more targeted and effective information flows and innovative ways of conducting and using ocean science, ocean science to support better policy making. And NZOC provides a really interesting and timely opportunity to rethink how we can bring those data flows into a more public domain. So how we, we can encourage more inclusive and participatory approach, uh, approaches to designing uh, and executing marine science and marine uh, policy and developing uh, innovative and uh, kind of exciting ways to engage uh, the public with uh, ocean science and with ocean policy making. Uh, with respect to part two of this work package, how does existing policy and regulation either enable or constrain the transition to an NZOC uh, approach? Well, um, what we found really that at the time of uh, writing, uh, there was very little regulation that provides clear direction really to those that are building, designing and operating net zero ships and other uh, vehicles like we would expect within uh, an NZOC uh, solution. So the regulation is, is lagging behind. Uh, we found that there's no reason really why any future NZOC uh, capability uh, wouldn't be compliant with UNCLOS uh, unless they are dangerous in some way, polluting, uh, nuclear powered would be a, a challenge, or um, would consider something, uh, sorry, would uh, transport something inherently dangerous or, or noxious, then uh, as things currently stand, that should be uh, fine within the uh, UNCLOS uh, rules, although that uh, is a, a difficult point to generalize. Uh, and uh, the NZOC itself should not be afraid to investigate technical solutions that go beyond the current regulations. As I mentioned a moment ago, the current law and legal framework surrounding uh, NZOC and surrounding autonomous vehicles uh, is lagging behind the technical changes that are possible in technical innovations. So there is an opportunity there, and this is my final point, for the UK to take a lead in the development of a legal regime and a regulatory regime, regime that helps the world transition to using the type of uh, technology that uh, the NZOC uh, approach supports. Thank you very much, Rihanna. I shall leave it there. Back to you. Thank you, Steve. Lots to think about there. Uh, so we'll move on to work package three, which is the future of ships, ship technologies and equipment. And this will be presented by Colin Day, Head of Strategic Projects at the National Oceanography Centre. So over to you, Colin. Thank you. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. Uh, this work package looked at uh, the ship technologies, but also the associated uh, research equipment um, that's going to be required uh, to move us to uh, a net zero capability for our operations. Uh, and also looking at the collaborative opportunities that this changing technology one is going to present. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of text here, but I'll just talk you through the, uh, the highlights here uh, of the findings from this work package. The NZO report showed us that um, emerging technologies that are going to influence ship design and fleet structures 
are going to have a lot more impact on the way we operate than just the choice of zero emission fuels and ships machines. The development and the uptake of marine autonomous systems and autonomous ships are going to form a central part of our, our integrated fleet operations and our uh, ship renewal strategies. And these emerging technologies are going to present us with enhanced opportunities across organizational engagement. Joint scheduling systems, such as the Marine Facilities Planning System, uh, will enable us to uh, share much greater information across international partners, uh, providing us with, with intelligence on our fleet operations. The Marine Facilities Planning System has been used by around 15 different organizations worldwide at the moment, uh, and potentially it's uh, an increasingly valuable tool for sharing programming information for collaboration. The next generation of the ships themselves the development of high-speed data transfer is going to enable automation and remote operation of a range of science activities on board the vessels, enabling our science community to work in very different ways, um, operating with real-time data, with shore-based um, science teams, ship-based science teams working collaboratively in real time. Also, the development of and the integration of marine autonomous systems and uncrewed vessels into programs is going to act as force multipliers alongside our standard surface ship operators, with both the autonomous systems and ships operating as independent programs and collaborating as combined programs uh, as integrated fleets. As has been mentioned a number of times previous um, uh, speakers, the increased diversity and integration of data gathering systems covering ships, marine autonomous systems, autonomous uncrewed surface ships, fixed seabed systems, floating instruments, satellites. This is going to present increased challenges for um, programmers uh, and infrastructure operators as that diversity of data gathering systems increases. Uh, and we have to manage and integrate the operation of those across the oceans. Looking at zero emission fuels themselves for the ships for the next two decades, our findings are that fuel technology and ships machinery uh, is likely not to be the limiting factor we feel, but the supply chain resilience, the supply chain infrastructure globally, and the global availability of fuels is likely to be more of a limiting factor for our adoption looking one and two decades into the future. We might find that we are um, uh, bunkering at uh, uh, areas uh, in, in different locations to where traditionally we've uh, been able to access our uh, marine fuel lines. Adopting the zero emission fuels is going to have a significant impact and challenge on ship design and the operate, operating profiles of our future vessels. Particularly, the reduced um, energy density of fuels means that we're going to have to have some significant, significantly greater uh, volume of storage uh, of fuels on board the vessels, increased training, increased technology requirements for the vessels, and also potentially reduced um, duration of the vessels. So this is going to present challenges for research vessel operators looking forward to the adoption of zero carbon fuels. In the interim period, in the next one or two decades, there are significant opportunities for the uh, embedding of ship energy and efficiency measures and approaching our program, um, program and efficiencies. Uh, and program and efficiency and energy efficiency measures are going to have a substantial benefit and medium term um, impact in reducing um, carbon for our existing vessels in the run-up to replacement of vessels. So these three key areas we feel are going to require us to work in much greater collaboration with our international partners, such as the International Ship Operator, uh, IRSO, Ocean Facilities Exchange Group, uh, OFEG, and the European Research Vessel Operators. These international established international forums um, are going to be really important in the future for us to exchange information, uh, exchange best practice on how we approach um, uh, fleet renewal programs 
and uh, increasing collaboration uh, across our programs uh, as we start developing these um, integrated um, data gathering systems in the future. I think that's my three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Lots of practical information there for hopefully stimulate discussion. Um, so we'll move on to work package four, uh, Marine Autonomous Systems. And we'll have Dr. Martin Furlong present this, who heads the Marine Autonomous and Robotic Systems Department at the National Oceanography Centre. So over to you, Martin. Sri Anand. Um, so I, uh, in this work package, we were looking at sort of marine autonomous systems and platforms. Uh, it's really interesting because there's a huge amount of uh, interest in these systems at the moment. This is both in the scientific, industrial and military sectors. Uh, the images on the right are just a tiny fraction of what's going on at the moment. And so they show some very large vehicles, a lot of new surface vessels which are coming up. And I also wanted to include um, Argo floats as platforms because there's a lot of work being done for the biogeochemistry uh, Argo floats and also deep Argo floats. So this drive towards marine autonomous systems is both for economic and environmental reasons. Uh, there's, there's huge economic benefits because in principle they're lower cost um, and also they reduce the, the CO2 uh, compared to ships. There's a strong push also for long range platforms, primarily as ships are really expensive. And I just wanted to say that there's a very large a variety of disparate systems and they're all optimized for different applications. And I'll touch on this on the next slide. So next slide, please. So I think the first thing I wanted to say is that although marine robotic systems are, you know, are very low carbon at the moment, they're, they're not inherently low carbon. And so if you compare a, a Tesla 3 versus a Ford Focus, looking at the UK grid at the moment, a Tesla is about a third of the CO2 per kilometre um, compared to a, a petrol driven car. And so although the grid is looking to decarbonize, so the image on the right is the UK um, uh, carbon intensity for the UK grid at the moment. And by 2030, the intent is to get to um, 100 grams uh, per uh, kilowatt hour produced. It's, it's going to be a challenge to get there. So one of the key things about marine autonomy is not um, that it's inherently lower carbon, but it's inherently smaller. And that decrease in size means that you use a lot less energy. And that's where a lot of the key advantages are. So I thought it's important to, to note because they're um, it's not a panacea using marine robotics. Um, there's a lot going on in marine robotics, robotic space. Uh, there's huge amounts of development, and a lot of this is leveraging uh, the other investments in robotics, autonomy, and microelectronics. Some of the key features which I'm very excited about is the advent of solid state batteries, which can be used in cars. And so this will increase the energy density in a lot of the um, batteries that you get for um, the marine robotic systems. Uh, Colin mentioned some of the benefits of uh, the higher bandwidth and this will to the both uh, uh, via satellite and this will come from the low Earth orbit satellite systems. There's also a lot of interesting stuff happening around quantum navigation, which will allow us to navigate more precisely underwater. That is, you know, far more speculative, but people are sort of looking at uh, bench systems at the moment for that high precision uh, navigation. The other trend that we're seeing um, both within marine robotics generally, but also um, broader robotics, is trying to link all these systems together. So it's all about systems of systems. Um, the reasons for this do this is it makes all phases of data collection easier. Colin was talking about um, the marine facilities planning website and how that could be used for planning. And it's the same tool that everybody uses. It's going to be really important to try and link all these systems together, both at the data plan or the planning phase, but also the um, when you look at the data collection phases. Um, the other thing I want to say is marine robotics are not the same as ships. So ships are highly flexible, um, marine robotics really aren't, and they tend to be very optimized for specific applications. So when we transition to a, a increased use of marine robotics, they are likely to be winners and losers, as alluded to by Kate earlier on. Um, the balance of winners and losers is an implicit choice that we need to make and we'll probably make now. So the developments that we um, progress over the next 10 or 15 years 
will dictate who is likely to win and lose and which disciplines um, are favoured by these systems and which ones aren't. So that's, I think it's just important to be aware of that. So some of the key recommendations um, from the report were to can you continue to improve vehicle control and bird commas intelligence. This is both from a fleet planning um, point of view, but also shore side control. So you can have effectively uh, the supercomputers working on the um, on shore controlling your long range assets, but also the onboard autonomy of the vehicles and also the onboard um, data analysis. So people often call this edge computing so that we can process the sensor data from the vehicle and just send back information in preference to just the raw data. Um, we also need to make sure that all of these systems are um, very well linked and integrated into the into the cloud. What do I mean by that? I mean the sort of like any integrated um, ocean observing systems which are available. So we need to make sure that these uh, platforms are designed to be as open as possible and so that they're readily integrated into whatever structures exist over the next sort of 10 or 15 years. Um, the final point I wanted to make is it's going to be really important to work with the science community to generate new use cases and also to scale up the fleet. And Kate was alluding to this earlier. Um, so the images on the right are just some of the systems which are happening now. So we're all aware of sort of glide, gliders going in and doing sort of uh, conductivity and temperature measurements, but we've recently just done some work with the auto sub long range vehicle looking at um, carbonate and nutrient sensors from Matt's group. There's also a whole lot of work looking at sort of sound systems, nutrient sensors and uh, sort of imagery of sort of phytoplankton and the like from, from gliders. Um, that's what's happening now, but over the next five or 10 years, we need to significantly increase the number of uh, you or the number of things that we can measure and sensors that we integrate onto these um, these platforms. And with that, I will I will stop. So thank you. Thank you, Martin, for that overview. And we'll move on now to the work package five, and we'll have a project lead for that, who is Professor Matt Molum at the Nat National Oceanography Centre. Matt heads the Ocean Technology and Engineering Group. So Matt, over to you. Hello there. So uh, thank you very much for uh, the time today. Can I have the next slide, please? OK, so it's, it's just a single slide. Um, and but there, there's an awful lot of detail that goes into Work Package 5. We looked at the, the problem of sensors and instrumentation. And as a thought experiment, uh, we compared a world that would be supported by future ships, uh, future research ships, with that where that where that was no longer possible. So, what would we lose? Uh, what would have to change? And what would we do if there was a, a very greatly reduced or even no research um, ships support available? <clears throat> and to do that, we worked with uh, Work Package One and looked at the various frameworks for ocean observing. Um, things like MSFD and OSPAR as well, to look, try and get an idea, idea of the totality of the requirement for the ocean observing capability, and then work through that in a quantitative way, uh, looking at how well those requirements could be met with the various uh, technologies. And that was very detailed, um, perhaps not detailed enough, I don't think it can ever be detailed enough, but there were some interesting preliminary findings um, for example, research vessels don't currently measure everything that the community and various regulations would require or want to do, or they don't, don't fulfil all of their ambitions. Um, somewhere between 55 and 60 percent um, of, 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 of the uh, total requirement, whereas autonomy at the moment does much less, about 70 percent of a ship's capability, so about 40 percent of the total requirement. And most of those gaps, not because the autonomy and the robotics and the floats and the moorings, all the non-ship systems can't get uh, to where uh, we need to make the measurement. Although that is a problem in some applications, most of it is because uh, without a ship, some parameters, some samples can't be taken, can't be measured, um, which turns the problem into that, well, how do you address the ability of those smaller, uh, lower, uh, emissions-based vehicles, how do you address their ability to make those measurements? And we, we did an estimation, and I think it's probably conservative, I think, to, to get up to about 80% uh, 
Um, so more than what ships can currently do um, uh, would need something like a, a 50 million, or well, certainly north of a 50 million pound sensor and instrumentation development program. Um, but if we could do that, uh, and we used, so it's interesting to see Martin's slide on how much carbon comes out of the grid. Uh, we used a figure for uh, renewable based generation. So the current figures for carbon produced for offshore wind, for example. <clears throat> and if you used um, rechargeable autonomy, um, you can save up to 90%, 97% of the emissions from the current carbon uh, oceanographic observing capability. So there's a huge win to be done. Uh, it doesn't work if you use primary batteries because of the embedded carbon in, in primary batteries. But if you can use energy harvesting, uh, renewable charging and uh, rechargeable batteries that we can get down as low as that. It still works without doing all of those things, but uh, it, that's the best way of doing it. And some of these, some of the things that the community uh, wants to measure could be measured now and relatively easily. Um, but there, and there are some really good emerging technologies that are filling some of the big gaps, um, for example, the in-situ chemical sensors, and artificial intelligence, space processing of imaging. Um, but there are still, still some really big challenges out there. Uh, for example, the very high precision physical oceanography uh, reference stations and anything that requires large equipment or currently samples. Um, for example, okay, Dr. Hendry talked about um, uh, you know, taking samples of the seabed coring. That's very difficult. Um, drilling and seismics were also quite challenging. And there's a number of complex biological and chemical targets that at the moment are very not impossible to do. And there are people thinking about how we do each of those things, but at the moment, uh, they're beyond the reach of current capability in large part. Um, so there's some things that can fill, fulfill multiple requirements. And that's quite interesting. So automated samples with preservation, for example, could help fill a lot of those gaps. Um, and, and, and in situ robotics that could um, give telepresence to science so they could do experiments without actually having to be there uh, may be an example. And there's a couple of companies or a few companies looking at that kind of capability. Um, but even with all of that, we still could only get to that 80% figure. So there's still be a number of things uh, that a reduced emission based ship uh, would, would be uh, required. And we should, like we, uh, we should acknowledge that not all autonomy is carbon free, even a, a, a green fuel is also not carbon free. Uh, ammonia, for example, has to be generated with input power. Um, and that means that we would have to do careful carbon accounting to look at the costs of the various uh, options. Um, I think like the other work packages, we recommend a continuous process of analysis and planning uh, and engagement of the community uh, from science users, stakeholders, uh, policy, uh, legal, uh, and technology developers, uh, users, and, and the, the, whole, the whole gamut um, to ensure we make the right decisions in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt, a great overview there as well. So we now move on to our final work package presentation, and this will be presented by Alvaro Lorenzo Lopez, from the National Oceanography Center. Alvaro is a software engineer within the Marine Autonomous and Robotic Systems Group. Over to you. Thank you, Rihanna. Um, you can go to the first slide if you want, it was the first and only slide. Um, in the data ecosystem work package, we had an interesting challenge because uh, I think we're the only ones that we don't go to see. While the other uh, kind, well, no, actually, no, the policy doesn't go to see there, but uh, all the other work packages address uh, pieces of kit that go to see. We are, um, I would define the data ecosystem as a connecting tissue uh, that put everything together. So I have an assessment and my introduction introductory phrase there is that our study focus on how data workflows should evolve to enable the use of autonomy at a scale. And it's actually not really true because it's not just autonomy and actually uh, it's just because I'm considering the ships as, as part of autonomy. It's, it's how all the workflows uh, from sensor to the users are um, 
as optimal as possible to do the best possible science. So a lot of the trends uh, that uh, my colleagues have uh, already mentioned on how we integrate data sets, how we make things visible, they, they were interconnected to this uh, work package. So we started uh, studying how the data what is the state of the current data ecosystem? And then from there, we uh, through uh, the same techniques using the other work packages, we've um, evolved our design to what we think the future data ecosystem should like should look. So I have put here some of the key findings. There are more on the report, but um, what we found is that an end-to-end -end approach uh, to data associated with research expedition and our mass platforms missions is required. Basically, how you need to design the entire workflow from the origin, from the sensor, until it is delivered. If Because if you don't do that, you can end on situations like what is still happening today in some parts of the system, that the data is very siloed. And when if you want to be as efficient as possible, you want to see all the data at any moment in time that is necessary to do your science. And I'm already trying to address some of the questions on Slido is um, and you need to design a system that works for different types of, of science. Uh, so it's a system, um, a broad system. Uh, collect data is very, very difficult and very, very expensive. So all the data should be fair, easy to access, findable, accessible, and interrupt and reproducible. Um, we should use machine learning techniques. Well, we should take a data science approach. Uh, today, machine learning uh, is, is just using anger or an industry on science so that uh, on the data ecosystem that should be leveraged. And we should always keep uh, using the most modern techniques that are useful for what we do at the moment is machine learning, but uh, AI, uh, will become uh, more common in use in the future, and that should uh, be part of what we are doing. Integrating integration of modeling, the data collection, and data sciences uh, will enable digital twins. Uh, I think there are questions about digital twins. Uh, what we did on the data ecosystem is not just to enable digital twins. In fact, I think digital twins are just a, an enabler of other things. So we have envisioned a system where digital twins are a key part of that system. And that's the, the middle image there, but it's just to help doing the collection and doing better science. The digital twin is not necessarily the objective on its own. But this is all, or big part of this is about digitalization. And when you increase your digital presence, you also increase your points of contact with the wall, the membrane that is uh, susceptible to uh, cyber attacks. Uh, when we put more, more things on this space, we are, can be vulnerable for that. So resilience is critical. Uh, these systems are going to be basically commanding or helping us decide how we do our science in near real time, if they go down, everything can go down and the science stops. And about the net zero question, because I haven't said that address anything about the zero carbon. Uh, we've uh, studied how we do at the um, science at the moment, how we maintain our infrastructure and how others are doing. And what we have found are claims from industry that they have become already net zero. Some, some big actors like Microsoft and Google and others like IBM, uh, Facebook uh, and Amazon, they, they claim they're going to be net zero. These claims are difficult to validate, but all the um, research we've done seems to indicate that the claims are real. But they also uh, the recommendations are also to keep addressing and keep vigilant. Uh, so theoretically, even right now, if we move most of our infrastructure to one of the net zero clouds, we, we will become net zero by default. But this these things can evolve rapidly. So those are some of the key findings. And I just extracted three of the recommendations. Uh, we need to develop a data skills strategy and including training that is very important that all the people is going to be 
using the data ecosystem so people need to receive the right training so they can use uh, these uh, tools that will be that they will be developed uh, we need to keep developing the data flow architecture and that's critical to move from the picture uh, the first picture to the last picture where from the silo data to the data data pooling and things and systems that are, are interconnected and we can uh, use them uh, in near real time and we should partner with industry to attack the net zero infrastructure. We are not going to be able to do it at science organization level because we don't have the resources to develop it. We can do some things, but industry is going to be leading. Um, there are more things on the report, but I just wanted to give you uh, an overview of what we with them. And we'll take questions, I guess, after this in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alvaro, and thank you to all of our speakers for those uh, really informative and helpful talks to stimulate discussion. So we will move into the question and answer session now, and there are plenty of questions on the Slido, so thank you for submitting those, and we've got some uh, clear uh, ones at the top there. So I will start from the top and work down. So the first question to our panellists is, a big part of the Argo success is due to the open, interoperable data commitment. So what steps are underway to make sure we get there for other types of AUV and ASVs? So I can already see, Alvaro, have your, you have your hand up. So if you'd like to um, come in. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. One thing to say, Argo is a very, very special community, how it's been formed and how people walk around. It is very centralized and a lot of effort is being put together and it, it's, it's very difficult to re, uh, reproduce in other communities, um, but some things that are happening in, in other areas. Uh, for, for gliders, for instance, the, there is the Ocean Gliders Initiative and other European international commitments that are pushing for um, uh, data standards. Uh, like the, there, is already, there are already a couple of starting their international formats. They are mainly for physical oceanography, um, but there uh, we're starting to hear about uh, potential standardization about all the formats of data and gliders. In AUVs, there are national standards. Potentially, in the UK, we have. Um, Oh, I, I forgot the name of the standard, probably Martin uh, will mention it in a second. I have seen his recent uh, uh, hand raise. Uh, so yeah, th there is work on that direction. Uh, it's not coming from ENSO. I think if there is a follow-up on ENSO, they should be a catalyst uh, for all of this. But there are many communities working. I think it will take a long time to have a community. Well, I don't know if what Argo has done is we can reproduce in other communities, but we should aspire to at least uh, follow on, on the footsteps. Yeah, certainly an uh, example of, of international collaboration working. And so, so an excellent case study for future, I would say, um, for us to, walk, to work towards. Um, Martin. Um, just to follow on from what Alvaro was saying, I mean, when we're looking at both designing and buying uh, new systems. There's a lot of focus on working with the likes of British, the British Oceanographic Data Centre to make sure that the the data flow from effectively the sensor through to all the data being available somewhere on the cloud um, is efficient as possible. So we're looking at trying to make sure that we're thinking about controlled vocabularies um, for all the metadata. Uh, using the right standards for the, the data coming out of the platforms and converting them into sort of um, sensible um, uh, standards. So uh, the likes of Medin will come up with um, sort of standards for how we should do the exchange within the UK. And so we are trying to align the, uh, I guess, the data that comes out of the platforms to international standards uh, so that it's as easy as possible to make sure that that data is fair once it's um, put up onto the cloud. It's it's hard. Um, there are lots of different sensors, and they don't all have you know international standards. But we're trying to work with that, and also things like the uh, Ocean Best Practice um, uh, system as well to sit there and try and uh, describe what we're actually going to do. 
Yeah, thank you. I'm sure many scientists in the audience can relate to the difficulty of uh, international standards and, and keeping that um, and working towards that is very difficult. Um, so we will go on to the second question. Um, have life cycle analyses been done for autonomous platforms to calculate and compare their carbon footprint, including deployment and servicing? So this will be one for our marine autonomous experts, I would think. Um, again, uh, Matt, would you like to come, come on on that one? So I think I described um, a little bit the process that we went through. So um, we did consider the embedded carbon um, in the platforms in the analysis that I um, presented. Um, a, a, the servicing actually was very similar between ships and um, and autonomy and so I, I neglected that as a comparative factor because I was just after a comparative number but it is there um, somewhere around the 10 to 20 percent additional uh, carbon expenditure due to uh, servicing in both uh, both ships and uh, non-ship systems um, but I did consider things like lifetime and total service um, duration and, and distance in those figures that I presented uh, I would say it was done at relatively low level fidelity and would be improved greatly by more data and a, a more complete model. But I think the sort of first order um, uh, conclusions you can draw from it are, are valid number, nonetheless. Thank you. And Martin. Um, so uh, similarly to Matt, we, we did look at this in, um, in the work package four report. Um, uh, the, the key thing to think about is that there's a big difference between a 5,000 ton ship and a 60 kilo glider. And so the propulsion, it's like moving one kilogram a kilometer. It's a lot more efficient if you have a 5,000 ton ship. But if you want to move a sort of a briefcase size sensor to some location in the ocean, you don't really need a 5,000 ton ship. So um, we did look at it. Uh, the interesting thing for me and the takeaway for me was similar to Matt, it's the amount of embodied energy in batteries. It really is uh, quite large, but you have to make an assumption about what the, um, like the carbon intensity of the grid is. And so, you know, it's like all of these things, it's really complicated. It's like the, the French grid is lower carbon because of all the nuclear power than the UK, whereas the German grid is higher carbon. So if you have a thing built in France, it's less embodied carbon than it is in Germany. Um, so yeah, we, we did look at it. Um, and just the small or the vastly smaller size of the, of the platform means that even if they're not very efficient at moving the, you know, the kilograms around, because they're so much smaller, they have a massive saving in CO2 compared to the ships. Thank you. And I guess, do you think that saving is still uh, proportionately massive, regardless of where that uh, grid energy is coming from? So relatively, at the moment, it doesn't matter too much. Um, broadly, yes. I mean, it's uh, if you have, a, you know, if you were powering everything with coal, it's obviously a lot worse than if you, you know, if you have a very renewable um, grid. Uh, I guess the other thing is that we can sit there and say it's very unlikely that we're going to we're going to move over to a coal powered um, grid so the the trend is always going to be a lower carbon intensive grid um. great thanks okay i think we'll move on to the next question um so this is one for our ship uh, ship experts i think uh, have you considered sailing vessels as platforms to launch and retrieve rovs and sensors um a 50 foot sailboat can meet many use cases without burning many dinosaurs. Colin. My thinking is um, sailboats, sailing boats do have a role to play, um, but there it is uh, in, some, in some niche areas, you know, particularly for, uh, for transit periods uh, where sailboats could um, support a small, low power. Um, activities or, or low power sensors or, or, or instruments. But if you think about the vessels that we're talking about for global operation, um, traditionally um, uh, these vessels uh, embark multiple 
um, systems of, of research equipment and instrumentation systems, both for remotely deploying or tether to the ships. Um, many of these are, are high power or relatively high power requirement systems. Um, and also frequently require the capability of ships to, to have effective positioning of vessel or dynamic positioning for, or for very high um, accuracy uh, location of the vessel. Plus the fact, a whole array of, of in integrated laboratories on board the ships. So I think the, the key um, uh, issue for using a 50 foot sailboat for some of the traditional activities of multi role science that we're looking at it is power um, uh, and the ability to put the ship where you want the ship, uh, to hold that position, uh, and to provide the onboard infrastructure um, for the vehicles and the instruments that you want to support. I mean, that said, um, uh, when we were doing the ENZOR project, we looked into to wind assisted. Uh, technology for our existing vessels, and there are real opportunities for uh, fitting sails to research vessels or more high technology type rotors for, for wind assist uh, power capability. Um, so I think there, there are opportunities to use sailboats. Um, uh, they, they do have the ability to, uh, to support a small, I would suggest, you know, lower powered um, uh, instruments and, and, and certainly ship fitted um, uh, data gathering systems. So there's a real role there for the traditional vessels, um, looking at large uh, integrated multidiscipline science, then I think there's a, there's a rather limited uh, opportunity for use in uh, small to medium size sailboats. Thanks, Colin, a really good explanation of that, I think, um, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant idea and it does play a role, but it is also uh, um, for those multidisciplinary crews, it's just not, um, not practical. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Um, our next question is about digital twins. Um, uh, I'm sorry, no, about discovery science, essentially. So science in support of di di digital twins and operational oceanography only represents a fraction of total science need. So how are discovery science projects needs being assessed in this context? So we've got hands up from both Alvaro and Kate. I'm not sure who was first. I think Alvaro. Okay. Probably Kate has something more interesting to say than me. So <laughs> I, I'll, I'll wait in line. Okay, I'll, I'll go for it then. Um, so I think it's a really interesting point. And I think it was one I didn't really sort of emphasize enough, but um, because it sort of had been mentioned in the animation before, um, but the, the can the sort of conclusion certainly that the science community came to throughout the workshops and surveys and so on is that um we're, we're never going to be able to sort of get rid of ships because as i think martin mentioned they're just so much more flexible so it really allows you to um to to uh, it allows all the different disciplines to do what they want to do and allows them to do it in a fairly reactive way so you know you have these two different types of observations you have sustained observations but also experimental sort of process-based observations that are really thinking about mechanistic understanding behind processes and it's that latter category that really that most discovery science will probably fit into um so I think I think that's what the scientific community sort of came to the conclusion to as well, which is that you know discovery science is something that is does require flexibility. It does require um, multidisciplinary approaches, um, and I think that this idea of using ship technology as well as aut uh, autonomous platforms is going to be key. That was my main point. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, Certainly from experience on ship, I know that it is very opportunistic often and that, that flexibility is really key. Um, so Alvaro, over to you. Uh, so I think how we've been envisioning the systems uh, is we need to design this next generation of systems with flexibility in mind. They, will, they need to be highly reconfigurable to cover different applications. So that mentioning about digital twins and operational oceanography, I, there, 
I think when when they mention here digital twins, they are, they may oh sorry cut. Uh, they may refer more about uh, well it's usually what happens forecast. So because I see digital twins more as a tool to solve problems, I think digital twins can help us to do better operational si uh, uh, oceanography. They can help us to do better discovery science. So I think the key is developing flexible, reconfigurable systems, and I think these all should be. Uh, part of this in conversation. Thank you. And Matt, over to you. So I th I, we look, look to this um, question, and I think, you know, there's no doubt that research vessels are incredibly capable, adaptable, flexible uh, platforms that allows some really uh, real-time uh, scientific innovation. But if you didn't have them, there are some things you could do to mitigate that loss, and it would be a loss. Um, so in some circumstances, it may be worth considering putting some of those things in place. For example, you know, it is technically feasible to have uh, telepresent operation of things like ROVs without there necessarily being a, a crewed vessel. It, it could be an uncrewed vessel. Uh, you could do it with remote communications if uh, necessary. Uh, it is technically feasible to produce reconfigurable sensors, samplers, and even the ability to do uh, retasked experiments at sea with, uh, with uncrewed low emission um, vessels. Um, and so, so, yes, vessels are always going to produce more capability, uh, but if you didn't have them, there are some engineering things we could do um, to alleviate that impact, and that may be useful in bringing down the overall net zero even if we were to have um, quite considerable residual ship capability. Thank you, Matt. Great to have everyone's perspective from all, all, all corners here. So over to Colin. Just want to make a, a very quick point following um, the last speaker is, uh, I, I'm, I think, I hope, um, that we're all going to be very surprised by the, uh, the quick um, uh, development of, uh, of uncrewed autonomous vessels. Um, and that is going to open up a, a significant opportunity for research operators worldwide. Mm. Carry out activities such as uh, Matt was talking about. There are currently um, organizations now that are deploying AUVs, large AUVs, uh, and large ROVs um, from uh, uncrewed uh, vessels. Uh, operating right now in the commercial sector, uh, and this is going to rapidly develop, uh, and it's a key area um, that um, research organizations need to focus on, because the operation of un uncrewed autonomous vessels in parallel um, to marine autonomous systems and traditional ships um, is, is, a, is a really exciting potential for integrated fleet development. <clears throat> well, uh, we are at one minute past one. I think that was quite a nice way to, to, to finish the webinar, unless anyone else wants to come forward and if any, anything on that point. Okay, we have many more questions in the chat, but unfortunately we are at the end of the session. Um, so thank you to everyone for participating today and for your contribution. It's been a really good discussion here. And uh, thank you to all our speakers for their uh, flash talks on the ends up report as well. They were all fantastic. So um, yes, thank you everyone for coming. That's all from me. And this session has been recorded, so we will also uh, capture these questions for future discussion and also make this recording available. Thank you very much. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.